Good evening, everyone. Thank you all for coming out tonight. I know we didn't provide any parking and the weather really wasn't working for us about an hour ago. Um, so I'm thrilled to see a full house here and of course not surprised for someone as illustrious as George Bodenheimer who lives right here in New Canaan with us. We're just so delighted to welcome George and Vince. Um, Oh, by the way, I'm Lisa. I'm the director of the library here. Um, and, and we're just so happy to have such great turnout to all of these events that we have, authors and other, other <coughs> events. Um, so you're here to see George, and you probably already know a lot of this. But George, ESPN cable industry pioneer. 
longest tenured president from 98 to 2011, overseeing the multimedia sports assets of the Disney Company from 2003 to 2011, simultaneously co-chairman of Disney Media from 2004 to 2011, and ultimately executive chairman of ESPN from 2012 to 2014. George also lives here in New Canaan, and he's actually a member of a, one of our committees here at the library, the Conversations with Business Leaders Committee, which puts together our annual Conversations with Business Leaders lecture, which just coincidentally happens this Sunday. Um, so we'd be delighted to see you all here for that as well. Joining George tonight is the longtime New Canaan resident and ESPN veteran, Vince Doria. Vince recently stepped down from ESPN after a multiple Emmy winning 23 years at ESPN. He's an accomplished journalist who worked on a number of ESPN initiatives over the years. He launched ESPN2 and ESPN the magazine. Most recently, as senior vice president and director of news, he was responsible for all news gathering efforts, efforts across the company, including Sports Center, Outside the Lines, and E60. We are so delighted that Vince could be here with us tonight, too. So this book is called Every Town is a Sports Town. And I've got to tell you, as a recent immigrant to New Canaan, <laughs> I have learned what a sports town this is. We have a big event tomorrow night, which is why there's no parking. We have this Books, Blues, and Barbecue. And I was away at the State Library yesterday, up near Hartford, and um, I got an email in the middle of the day saying, the Rangers final is on tomorrow night. <laughs> We're going to have to stream it or all the men will leave. <laughs> so I gotta tell you, I was a little ambivalent, you know, about this, uh, but I was shot down in flames by the rest of the team working on this and said, if we want the men to stay, we will have the streaming hockey. So tomorrow night, <laughs> if you haven't already got your tickets for tomorrow night, and if you were worried and hadn't bought them because you were worried about the Rangers game, now you can kill both birds with the one stone. So every town is a sports town. Well, ESPN, as we all know, completely changed the landscape in sports journalism and sports reporting. And George has been here right from the beginning. ESPN grew and George grew along with the company. He played a major part in making ESPN a daily presence, not just here in the US, but globally. This book is all about ESPN's meteoric rise to the top of its media platform, and George along with it. Please welcome George Bodenheimer and Vince Story. <laughs> Lisa, thank you for that great introduction. My wife, Anne, is here tonight with me. And she, you, you read it just as she wrote it. Just <laughs> wrote my whole thing. Thank you. And there really is, thank you, Vince, in advance for uh, being here tonight. You might not feel that way with us. Yeah, I know. You're, you're tough. I know you're tough. Tough but fair. Well, all right, so I have notes. George wrote the book. He knows that I only read it once. I need the notes. Uh, let's, let's, start, let's start where you start the book. Uh, 1980. You're a recent graduate of Denison University in Ohio. You're back living at home with your parents and Greg, attending bar part time. You want a job in sports anywhere. Uh, and you're armed really with a college degree, uh, a rule that your family lives by, and some good advice from your dad. And all of that combined to connect you with ESPN at some point. And what transpired from there? So tell us about the rule, your dad's. Uh, Well, I, uh, I actually uh, open up the, the book with that. The first chapter is called Two Minute Interview. And it, as Vin uh, said, I was uh, looking for work. I only grew up about 10 or 12 miles south of here. And I'd written a letter to every Major League Baseball team. And uh, back then, of course, that actually meant you wrote a letter. <laughs> and I remember typing them out at my dining room table with my dad and the correcto tape and all the different <laughs> addresses and everything. And, so there was 28 teams back then. My letter said, uh, you need me in your front office. And I, uh, I sent out the letters. I got back 27 we don't think so's. 
And I got one interview out of that. Um, I got one interview out of that with the Philadelphia Phillies. Uh, coincidentally, the owner of the Phillies uh, was a dentist in grad, so that's how I got the invitation. So that's how I got the interview. No job. It was 1980. The Phillies had won the World Series. He gave me a tie. He gave me a Phillies tie, but no job. Um, so I'm back in Greenwich trying to figure out what to do. A friend of my dad's was at CBS. Uh, he said, gee, have you ever thought about cable television. I, I'd never even heard of ESPN. Of course, living here, as you know, back in the old days, you didn't need cable to get seven or eight channels from New York. So I don't even think I'd even heard of ESPN. So I was looking for work and wrote the letter and got an interview. Drove the 60 miles up to Bristol, right past New Canaan on the Merritt. And uh, my interview, uh, it's a little bit of an overstatement to call it an interview. Uh, I'm not sure that the head of human resources actually, actually looked up at me during my entire interview. Uh, he's looking at my resume with my degree in economics. He says, well, uh, you'd be qualified to be a driver. <laughs> and I was afraid to say, well, what does a driver do besides drive? He said, well, you deliver the mail, and when, it's, when it snows, you're the one that we give the shovel to. <laughs> and it pays $8,000 a year. We might have an opening next week. We may call you. Thanks a lot. And I was out in the parking lot two minutes later, that was the interview. So I, I remember vividly driving back to 60 miles uh, to Greenwich, and uh, I was close with my parents, I still am, and uh, I was thinking, what am I going to tell my dad about this interview? <laughs> I'm unsure what to do, whether to take it. He took me out, uh, actually took me out for a beer that night. It was a, a venerable old place for any of you who lived here a long time, you'd, you'd know the clam box in Koskov was a venerable place. We went there for a beer and some chowder. And uh, he gave me, I think, the best advice I ever received, which is why I think this book works for young college students and people just starting out careers. He said to me, if sports television is a career you think you could be interested in, then you should absolutely take that job. Uh, you make a career decision, not a money decision. Get your foot in the door and you know, see where it, it takes you. And fortunately, smart enough to take his advice, Vince. Uh, a week later, I was delivering the mail, and I spent the next 33 years uh, at ESPN. <laughs> so that first job, you were in the mail room. Not exactly a glamorous TV job you were looking for. Uh, but you got an assignment uh, with ESPN on air personality. It comes up several times in this book. Tell the story. Yeah, but Dick Vitale was my first assignment. And for those of you who watch ESPN, you know Dickie V. I mean, what you see is what you get. He is the same person. He doesn't just flip a switch on when he turns on, the camera turns on. He, he's that person. And uh, he was a, a handful. Uh, <laughs> um, but actually, we became friends. And uh, you know what? It really struck me because Dick was already an NBA coach, college Division I coach. He was already a television personality. He was a big star, really. And he befriended me as a driver. So your job was picking him up at the airport, taking him to the ESPN, basically. Yes, and uh, that was that was that was it. That was my job. Yeah, but we established a friendship, and uh, it's still I, we still have that friendship over 35 years. For anybody who ever hears him on the radio, he tells versions of that story, which change every time. <laughs> One version had me ready to jump off at George Washington Bridge, but he talked me off of it. <laughs> Well, the next turning point for you came in 1982, but before we get to that, uh, I want to hear from you on a topic that, that always comes up uh, uh, when people who work at ESPN talk about the place, primarily when they talk about you, uh, and that's the culture of the place. It's, uh, it's a difficult term to characterize. You do it very well in the book. Uh, talk about the culture you experienced when you got to ESPN and how that culture played an important role for you really throughout your career. The, the, I think culture is the strategic advantage of, of, of the ESPN company. Uh, it's a culture that's based on family values, integrity, passion, risk-taking. Uh, really, you know, as I said, family values. And when I was up there, uh, just like tonight, and it's great to see a lot of friends, not only from New Canaan, but there's a lot of uh, uh, veteran ESPNers here. I don't want to call you old ESPN. <laughs> veteran ESPNers here, so they know that I'm talking about. There was really a, just an atmosphere of you have each other's back. And we 
so working 22 hours a day, most of us were you know, 24 years old, happy to, be making a pay, happy to be getting a paycheck, happy to be in sports. But that really struck with me, it was that kind of atmosphere that you know, I could, call, I could call up the head of advertising sales and say, hey, I'm in the mail room, I might be interested in ad sales, you know, could I have a cup of coffee with you sometime to learn about sales, I might be interested in that. And the answer was yes, and you know, come in next Tuesday. And all those things struck me uh, so much so that when I was fortunate enough to be named president 17 years later, I really was uh, wanting to concentrate on enhancing the culture and making sure that that spirit that was forged in 1979, 80, 81, 82, that that spirit lives at the company, which I think is stuck. Uh, Mike Stoltz, which is a VP of communications uh, in your case, Dallas uh, Four, is possibly. Uh, uh, can you hear me? No. 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 Well, gee, I don't know why. It's a green You've only been in television all these years. Yeah, green light, so I, what can I tell you? <laughs> all right, I'll talk louder. How's that? Yeah. 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 All right, good. So anyhow, uh, Stoltz has told the story that uh, there's a reporter up at ESPN who was doing a profile on you. And Stoltz, this good PR guy that he was, put a little spin on the guy. He says, you know, George Bozheim loves everybody in the world. And there are thousands of people here. He knows them all. So the reporters decide, well, I'm going to test this. So as Stoltz is taking him around ESPN, this guy's stopping everybody he sees and asking them if they, if they know George Bozheimer, if they've ever had any interaction with him, and so forth. And virtually everybody they talk knew him, but had some personal story to tell about George. And this is a, a company of, you know, probably 6,000 people on campus right now. How did you remember all those numbers? <laughs> <laughs> well, I actually, I worked at it. You know, I worked at learning people's names, so it doesn't come easy, and I, I put a lot of time and effort into it, so I, I, I worked on it is, is, is the answer. But, uh, you know, I, again, I, I learned a lot of things from my parents, and one of them was to respect everybody. That was the rule, the golden rule. Everybody, regardless of your position, I mean, I don't, you know, whether you're in the mailroom or you're in the security guard or you're cameraman or you're a person making lunch in the cafeteria or you're a vice president, you know, I think everybody contributes to the company. And I really emphasize that that's how I felt. And I, I try to learn as many names as everybody as I could. Yeah, well, you did that rule, you know, and there wasn't enough notice up there. So, maybe in answer to uh, you know it's a job post. Pick it up there and tell us what happened. Maybe just take us through Texas, Chicago, Denver, and Denver, where you really got in the middle of some uh, you know, power brokers and some cable industry. Right. How's this? Okay. All right. All right. You came to hear him anyhow, so you know, it's not a big deal. Go ahead. So uh, it's 1982. I've been there 18 months or so, and uh, I had learned that I wanted to go into sales and marketing. And, uh, a job came open in Texas uh, for a salesman uh, to represent ESPN in the five states in the Southwest. And uh, I applied for the job. My friends in the marketing department gave me some magazines. Actually, Joan, Joan Wright is here, and I <laughs> was in that department. And uh, so I'm flying out of Dallas. I'm trying to smarten myself up with uh, these trade magazines. And uh, I actually got, I, I got the job. I evidently sounded smart enough to get the job. It's just not working the rest of the way. It's like the early days of cable. Yeah. <laughs> One mic, two, two talent, loose, loosely defined. But uh, anyway, so I go down, I get the job. Uh, I later learned that I was the only person in the company that applied for it. That's true. So it greatly enhanced my chances of getting it. Back in the old days at ESPN, the primary prerequisite for getting promoted was a pulse. <laughs> company was growing and anyway so I got the job so I find myself in Dallas by the way my first day on the job my boss said hey take the afternoon to buy a car and find an apartment he gave me like four hours off to do all of that but back in those days you I got it done it wasn't as good as it wasn't as good a dealership as Carl Chevrolet by the way I see, I see. anyway uh, I found myself driving around Texas Arkansas Oklahoma Louisiana and Mississippi I grew up 12 miles south of here. <laughs> I had never seen anything like that, that part of our, our great country. The people I met, the towns, the geography, it was a wonderful experience. But every town I was in, my speech was like, hey, uh, we're from Connecticut. 
I should have let that Connecticut thing out. It, wasn't that, it didn't play that big down there. But we have this 24-hour sports network. And we'd like you, Mr. Mom and Pop Cable Operator, to put it on your cable system uh, uh, because uh, we're, we're, you know, it's going to be popular, people are going to love sports, all that. So I got the same answer whether I was in Waco, Tulsa, Biloxi, Jackson, you name it. Wherever I was in those five states, the answer was, hey, George, you know, 24-hour sports sounds like a crazy, crazy idea. I mean, why would we need 24 hours of anything? Uh, but we'll put it on if you're giving it away which we were at the time, because you know, insert any town, think New Canaan, this is a sports town. That's how I got the title for the book. And I quickly learned that every town in the United States of America, if not the world, considers themselves a sports town. It might be high school, might be college, might be pro, could be a combination, varies on where you are. But sports, as you know, Vince, plays an integral part in the fabric of this country. Uh, it holds towns together. Think of, think of the Turkey Bowl when our town uh, goes and cheers on our team, or think of how much spirit there is for our teams here, um, or think about the healing that's role that sports play. I mean, think 9/11, Hurricane Katrina, or even the uh, the Boston uh, Marathon attack. Think of the role sports plays. So, anyway, sports is such an integral part of our country, and really ESPN was able to tap into that. Uh, and really has been riding that wave for, for 35 years. But that's, that's how I got started kind of on the sales side, running around the Southwest. And, and, uh, and then you, you quickly went to Chicago for a very short time. And then Denver. Talk about what happened in Denver. There. Denver, I uh, found myself in Denver a couple years later. And uh, by then uh, I had met my wife, Anne, who grew up in New Canaan. Uh, and her mother and father, Jack and Kay Pugliese, are here tonight. I've been blessed with great in-laws. Uh, uh, so I went all the way to Texas to meet a girl from New Canaan. <laughs> In fact, we were introduced to someone else from Connecticut. Like, you could po only possibly be the two people from Connecticut here tonight. So you, you two should meet. Anyway, uh, we got married and found ourselves in Denver a couple years later. And Denver was really the cable capital of the country back then. Uh, it was a very entrepreneurial business run by kind of maverick businessmen, Bill Daniels, John Malone, of course he's in the papers now today or yesterday again, uh, and a lot of uh, entrepreneurs out there. And all of a sudden I found myself being the manager of that office. So it ended up being a great opportunity. And actually uh, here tonight, really pleased and surprised to see uh, the fellow who was the president of the company at that time, uh, Mr. Bill Grimes is here with us tonight. Really nice to see you, Bill. Bill was the president of ESPN when I got transferred out there. Thank you for okaying that, Bill. <laughs> you were the only applicant. <laughs> there was no one else left to transfer to Denver, so they transferred me. Anyway, uh, long story short, those were the years when we first got involved with the NFL. And while Bill and his lieutenants like Roger Werner and Steve Bornstein were really the, exec were, were the executives of the company making the big decisions and cutting the big deals, I did find myself in the advantageous position of running what was arguably the most important office. So while I was taking orders and doing my best to follow instructions, it was my office and I was the manager of it and we, we delivered and we signed up all those accounts uh, in the early days for the NFL and that was really, a, that was 1987 which was a huge turning point for ESPN. Well, Yes, uh, relationships definitely played an important role. I mean, I, I think the most valuable thing that I learned 
at that time was whatever you're selling, and we were selling ESPN, but whatever you're selling to have confidence in your product and don't let anybody tell you your product is only worth X. Uh, we found ourselves in a pretty fortunate position, uh, not only because of the strength of sports, but the entire cable industry was exploding. Uh, we really, it was the go-go years, uh, early 80s, early, early to mid 80s. I mean, you know, MTV, USA, CNN, TBS, HBO, all the, ESP, the ESPN channels. I mean, really it was, it was when the whole business was starting to grow, but ESPN was and still is the most valuable channel out there determined by the subscribers. I mean, we've been looking at the same uh, research for 20 years and, and people hold ESPN at the top of the list, particularly amongst men, uh, of their most valuable channels. So we, we weren't shy about asking for what we thought it was worth. And as the NFL and baseball and NBA and NASCAR and everybody else decided their, their product was worth more money, we knew we had to get more money from the cable operators in order to pay for it. Uh, but to your question about relationships, I, I think personal relationships in business are probably the most important thing. And frankly, I think by the way some people choose to operate, they, they lose sight of that. Because if you work hard and establish relationships and treat people with respect and give them the straight answer and do what you say you're going to do and follow up when you say you're going to follow up, it puts you ahead of a lot of other people who just don't do that for whatever reason. And so those relationships came in very handy when we had to go and pretty much put some tough terms on the table um, and say, you know, here's the new price of poker, if you will, if you want to carry ESPN. And I'm just, I'm proud to say we were able to, you know, do that with integrity and, and, and get it done for the company. Well, too, that uh, a lot of people said, George, we hate the price, but we really like you. And that was a factor. All right. <laughs> I like the yeah. Well, all right. So in between '87 and '96, there uh, we launched ESPN2 in 1993. That was good for me because I was hired to uh, to run the program and uh, launch the studio program was there. But it wasn't a launch that was met with a lot of enthusiasm by cable operators. And uh, you know, the general conventional wisdom at the time was we talked about the original ESPN. We need 24-hour sports. It was much worse when people were asking the question, do you need two 24-hour sports channels here? Did you or your team, and this is a time when Congress had just passed something called the uh, transmission consent provision. And I'm going to let George explain it. Uh, you do a very good job of simplifying it in the book. But you guys came up with a, an idea that was elements of brilliance in it. I don't think I'm overstating it to say that in order to sell ESPN2. So talk about that. Well, that was 1993, and so it's 14 years after ESPN had launched. We'd wanted to launch a second channel because we had more programming than we could put on one channel. But we went to the cable operators and said, we'd like to launch a second channel. And I mean, they looked at us like we were, you know, from Mars. Like, well, wait a sec, don't we already pay you enough? And uh, why do we need two? And uh, really the confluence of events where Congress passed this law and it is painfully complicated, so I'm going to really simplify it. I try to simplify everything, by the way. Uh, they enabled the broadcasters, ABC, CBS, and NBC, to get paid, period. That's all you need to know about it. The cable operators hated that because ABC, CBS, and NBC deliver their signals over the air for free. All you need is an antenna. So why should we, why should we the cable industry, pay for something that's free? It's a much more complicated argument than all that, but that's as simple as it got. So we were owned by ABC. So we went to the cable guys and said, hey, if you launch ESPN2, we will provide you the, the uh, consent to carry the ABC network. And that combination of those two was uh, considered a, uh, a, a very smart move. Fox also had a similar model, so we can't take 100% credit for that. But it was a, a, a unique point in time and that, you know, we launched uh, ESPN2 at the time in a record 10 million homes on October 1st, uh, 1993, using that, that method. And that method is still going on today, uh, whatever it is now, 20 years later, 20 years plus. That, that same business model is still working. So given ESPN's growth and the success with affiliates with the NFL, success with ESPN2, your star was clearly in ascendancy. 
at ESPN. And uh, in 1998, I guess, uh, you found out some very good news about yourself in a very unusual way. Tell that story. Yeah, by, by 1998, I was the head of uh, sales and marketing. Um, so while it was nothing formal, I was you know, one of the top three or four people in the company. And my office happened to be on the other side of the conference room from the current president, Steve Bornstein. And uh, one day I'm going through the papers in my uh, inbox, and there's a memo from Steve Bornstein to the chairman of Walt Disney Company, Michael Eisner. And it says, uh, I want to make George Bodenheimer president. I'll call you next week. <laughs> and I'm like, well, this is interesting. <laughs> um, and so I picked it up, and I walked across to his office, and I said, uh, I think this is yours. And he looks at it, and he's, he, you know, and there's, a few, there's more than a few people here that know Steve. He looks at it, he says, yeah, sit tight. Get out of here. You know, that was pretty, that was pretty much what he said. That's how I learned that I was, I was going to be the president of ESPN. It was, uh, it was, it was pretty glamorous. <laughs> more television glamour. Yeah. All right, so in November of 1998, uh, you become president of ESPN. And uh, the folks who were running Disney at the time, Michael Eisner and Bob Iger, with his number two, impressed upon you to grow the brand, to grow the ESPN brand. Uh, this is coming up to you know, the year 2000 here, obviously. And <coughs> one of the ideas here was to launch a, a volume program called Sports Century uh, that would uh, you know, look at the great sports stories of the 20th century, the stars, the teams, the stories, and so forth as the 21st century dawned. So you took a 26-year-old kid named Mark Shapiro, who was Digging away in our Los Angeles offices. And I'll take some of the credit because I had hired him as a production assistant to work on uh, Jim Rome's uh, talk show out there. But you brought him in and put him in charge of this project. And he met with some resistance uh, at ESPN. But Mark did a unbelievable job at Sports Century. You ultimately put him in charge of original programming at ESPN uh, and ultimately in charge of both production and programming. You did a remarkable job at Yeah, by the way, uh, before I talk about that NBA negotiation, Vince <laughs> is a, a very humble man, and Lisa touched on it in her introduction, but for all of you, all you men and women that like to watch ESPN, and you watch SportsCenter, E60, Outside the Lines, or listen to ESPN Radio, or log on to ESPN.com, or read the magazine, all ESPN works hard every single day to cover the news. There's games, and there's the sports news, right? Those are really the two big pieces of ESPN. This man, to my right, was responsible for all of the news gathering for ESPN for over 20 years. Uh, and that is one difficult, difficult job. Uh, we, we work hard to get the story right, journalists. Uh, but I, if you, I hope you... Well, one of the things in my book, I talk about people. And uh, it's really a book about people. It's about the people of ESPN. But in addition to having you know, a wonderful fellow New Canaanite here to share the stage with me tonight, I wanted to invite Vince Dory because Vince is one of the people that I mean when I talk about how great the people are of ESPN. Uh, does his job every day with integrity, uh, works his butt off. I don't know how many, how many drives you made from New Canaan to Bristol. Suzanne, his wife, is here tonight, knows all those drives. But anyway, I just want to make sure to give people like Vince Doria, a you know, 23-year career that just ended his proper due for what you see, hear, and read on the ESPN company. Thank you. So long story short, we're in this negotiation. 
with David Stern. And if you haven't ever negotiated with David Stern, um, well, let's just say it's an interesting experience. He's an excellent negotiator. He's a smart man. He has a good product. We're on the verge of a major win for ESPN, getting back into the NBA in, I guess it was 01 or 02, after being out for 15 years. So we're, we're about to make a major breakthrough, and it's 3 in the morning at the NBA offices. It's me and uh, my lieutenant, Mark Shapiro, and Stern and his lieutenants, Adam Silver and uh, Ed Desser. And we're arguing about how many WNBA games to carry. And we're having, it's a momentous argument. We're, we're, we're discussing whether to carry 13 games or 12. <laughs> and uh, Mark is also a very good negotiator. And uh, I, my hallmark of my management style is to let my people do their jobs. So he was sitting there negotiating whether it was 12 or 13 games. And uh, in my view, uh, he should have conceded 12 because it wasn't significant. And it was the end of a long negotiation, and we had won the prize, which was the NBA. And uh, he held on, and finally the NBA conceded, but it was at a cost. You know, we, we really alienated our new partner for unnecessary. And Mark and I left that office at 3 in the morning. We're walking through Manhattan back to our hotel rooms. And uh, I just said to him, I said, you, you know, you made a mistake in there tonight was unnecessary and I think you know it did, its, it, did it, it did more damage than saving us from, you know from televising one less NBA game or, and uh, anyway that's what Vince asked me about but uh, you know Mark Mark will tell you himself that that you know he, he learned from that and you know, I think it's an important lesson you, you're negotiating with people you're trading we're negotiating billions of dollars 10-year deals we've got to work with people for a decade after you sign those deals so You've got to give a little uh, to make the other people feel good uh, at the negotiating table, but, but that's the point. Yeah, why don't we uh, open it up for questions here. I've got more here, but I know there's a lot of questions out there, so sure, go ahead. George, could you please say a little bit about the beginnings of ESPN? How did ESPN get started even before your time? The question is about ESPN in, in the very early days, and as, and as I said, we've got a number of folks here uh, who, who are, you know, I have to actually come up with a credible answer, because um, <laughs> we've got Bill Grimes here, and one of our earliest consultants, uh, Charlie Warner, is here this evening as well, as well as a number of employees. But Bill Rasmussen uh, was the founder of ESPN. Uh, he actually got fired by Gordy Howe's wife um, as the communications director for the New England Whalers was the WHA before they were in the NHL. And uh, so he was bumping around Hartford, Connecticut, and he had this idea for what at the time was a 24-hour Connecticut-wide sports network. His original ambitions were just for our little state of Connecticut. When he started to investigate it, and he talked to the satellite companies, they said to him, well, gee, if you're going to invest, and I have this in the book, if you're going to invest $35,000 a month in the satellite technology to transmit this, your new sports network, you don't have to limit your aspirations to the state of Connecticut. The signal will go clear across the United States of America. So that's how ESPN went from a man, you know, in Bill's mind, from a Connecticut network to a nationwide network. Uh, he didn't have two nickels to rub together. He was putting money on his, on his credit cards, borrowing money from family members. Uh, finally, in almost a last-ditch last effort, he got the Getty Oil Company uh, to put up $10 million. Uh, which was, I think, Bill, for 85% or 90% of the company. And uh, without the Getty money, ESPN may never have, have made it that far. Um, but about a year after his idea, September 7th, 1979, uh, ESPN went on the air. And, uh, but it was really a crazy, frenetic period to get there. Question. Um, having said that, it's maybe a little indelicate question. 
Will you also listen to the podcast? I don't know if you could talk for a, a minute about Bill Simmons, somebody that we really, really like. I don't know if uh, there's more, more ESPN is thinking about podcasts, but just Bill Simmons in general and what happened over the last month or so. Well, first of all, thank you for your comments about the company and uh, – I used to tell my, my kids, don't get on the bus without knowing if the local teams won or lost. You'll have no credibility. <laughs> so get on Sports Center. And uh, so I'm glad you, you're living the dream as well. Uh, podcasting, I mean, podcasts are a huge business for ESPN. Not only do they enhance the way fans can enjoy the product, and I think ESPN was ahead of most major media companies, and we have a lot of media folks here tonight. But it was, a, and I talk about this in the book, all ESPN did is follow its mission to serve fans. So when all of a sudden, you know, the internet uh, comes along and we can access scores on our computer, there's no question ESPN is moving in that direction uh, and working on or the phone. Uh, so podcasts were just the next best, next thing, and so there was no question ESPN was going to move into that direction. <coughs> As far as Bill is concerned, excuse me, I mean, Bill uh, actually played a huge role at ESPN. He was the first big internet sports writer, if you will. Uh, then got very involved in uh, our NBA coverage. And then, of course, uh, he was instrumental in our 30 for 30 uh, film packaging, our documentaries, which has been a big hit for ESPN. So he played a huge role in the success of ESPN over the last couple of years. Of course, I'm no longer at ESPN. I left there last May, so I can't speak to any of the specifics of what actually went on that resulted in him leaving the company in the last few weeks. But uh, he'll be missed, and uh, I wish him nothing but the best. George, I was just wondering if you had any perspective on the current uh, soccer scandal. Uh, is this something that surprised you? Did you expect it? Do you have any inside information? <laughs> this just in, World Cup popular. Um, well, you know, all, you know all that nice stuff I just said about Vince? The other reason I wanted him here was he's actually an expert on the question you asked. And in his role, all kidding aside though, we just did a really nice piece on E60. And I would like to hand the microphone to Vince because he knows more about the answer to your question than I do. Well, I don't have any scoops here, otherwise it would be on television. But, uh, yeah, Jeremy Schapp just did an hour show on E60 uh, about two weeks ago, and we just re-aired it last night in the wake of it. As far as what happened, I, I think the, you know, the sad thing about it, I don't think anybody was surprised. There was a lot of drama in terms of the way the uh, arrests were made and so forth at their big meeting, their Congress uh, in Zurich there and so forth. But this investigation had been going on for years, actually, and uh, it had been well reported that it was underway. So, in that regard, it wasn't terribly surprising, but it's a, it's a, you know, it's a small disaster for FIFA. And uh, uh, Seth Blatter, who is the uh, president of FIFA, has been for a long time. There's actually an election, for those of you who have been following it, scheduled tomorrow. It looks like it's going to take place. He's been asked to resign by the head of uh, UEFA, which is the, uh, the British arm of FIFA there. Uh, he's not going to resign. Uh, he was asked to postpone the vote for six months. It doesn't look like that's going to happen. And he will probably be reelected on Friday, uh, the way that thing works. So I don't know, it'll be hard to say what happens. I mean, for, for those of you that haven't been following this, and I'm sure there are a lot of people out there that haven't, this basically involves allegations that votes were bought to give the uh, World Cup to Russia in uh, 2018 and to Qatar in 2022. There are further allegations about votes being bought to elect and continue to re-elect Sepp Blatter as president. FIFA runs a, 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 as its own little fiefdom, really, and it doesn't have much accountability to anybody, and it has total control over where the World Cup's played, uh, who gets the television rights to it, uh, and who's elected president. So, you know, we're all kind of cynical that there'll be much change there, but it's going to be interesting to see what happens. I don't know if that answers much of your question, but that's, that's what we know about it right now. By the way, one other thing, and 
uh, I think ESPN played a big role in helping soccer grow in this country in the last eight years with the, with the job that we did from uh, South Africa and then most recently uh, Brazil. And uh, we're, we're out of it now for a couple of cycles, but uh, hopefully we can get back in. Yes? What was the very first broadcast uh, on ESPN and, and, and in its very, very earliest days, what were some of the sort of perhaps least memorable uh, <laughs> programming that you used to sort of, you know, fill, fill the 24 hours? Well, the question is what was the very first, the very first event on ESPN that evening was uh, a game in the Slow Pitch World Series. I'm surprised you don't remember. <laughs> it was the Milwaukee Schlitzes versus the Kentucky Bourbons. Sponsored by Budweiser, Bill. I mean, we had it all going that very first night. Um, but as far as your question, I mean, we, we televised whatever we could get. Uh, table tennis, Australian rules football, uh, softball, uh, various collegiate sports. I mean, one of the brilliant things that Bill Rasmussen did was he did the satellite deal, $35,000 a month. He did a deal with Anheuser-Busch, over a million dollars. Credit to Anheuser-Busch, too, for taking a chance on a completely unknown entity. But perhaps his most brilliant stroke was he went out to the NCAA and convinced Walter Byers, who I think may have just passed away, I, I read today, uh, was the chairman a number of grueling meetings and trips to Kansas City to license college sports to uh, ESPN. And while it wasn't live college football, it was tape delay college football and a number of other live events. So we did all kinds of gymnastics, uh, men's and women's golf, softball, uh, you name it, we did it. Hi, Lee. Hi, George. You've, um, you've used the word integrity a couple of times. And when you think of integrity and you think of business leaders and also what's going on with sports these days, especially from the athletes all the way up to the commissioner's office, can you speak to a low point in your career that challenged you and you had to kind of reflect back to the values that your father um, instilled in you and share that with us? Well, I really want to thank you for coming. <laughs> a low point. Uh, so when you had to give, all of a sudden no, I don't negotiating know. against Mr. Kerry over at Fox for billions of dollars in 10 years, and you know you're not going to have another shot at this. I'm just kidding. It was, it's a great question. Uh, I mean, I'm, 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 of course I'm stalling because I'm having a hard time thinking of what, what the right answer to that is. But, you know... I, I, I'm, there's a lot of low points, and we had a lot of misses, and we didn't get every contract, and we got outbid by Chase Carey, you know, uh, every, every, you know, regularly, and, uh, and, and all of our other competitors. But I, I think if you just kind of maintain a steady keel, and you, you are who you are, and don't get too high or too low, and, and, and stay, stay straight with people, I, you know, I just think that's the way to go. And that's, that's really all I'm talking about when I talk about integrity. Your, you know, your word has to be good. That's kind of it. Yes? Um, do you ever have any second thoughts about the role of sports on college campuses and uh, the, the uh, many campuses where you might say that sports is um, too great a focal point on the college campus? That's a great question. I mean, the question is, uh, do we ever, do I ever think about or have second thoughts about the role that ESPN plays or just the size of college athletics overall? Is that kind of the question? Well, where college sports, I mean, co how college sports seem to dominate and you know, the highest paid person in many states is the college football coach at the state university and, and the academic records of the students and so forth. Do you ever say, um, maybe this could could evolve in a better direction or no <laughs> <laughs> just kidding uh, you know I mean I look I we, we've been involved with college sports since 1979 and and the dollars have, have grown uh, as they have grown I think you know for the most part uh, for the most part that has been a positive influence on on the college and university system all those funds essentially flow to the colleges, and of course the decisions about what they do with them after that are their decisions, not, not ESPN's decisions. So 
I would say while there's legitimate questions, and I think you're seeing a lot of that analyzed in the college community today, um, I, I think overall ESPN's been wonderful for college athletics. And I, I was just watching the women's softball championships today. I, mean, it was, it, I know I'm not objective, but it was wonderful. Those gals can play, and I don't know if that would all be there. It certainly wouldn't be on television if it wasn't for how the uh, industry has grown over the years, and they certainly look to be enjoying themselves. So um, I would say overall uh, it's been extremely positive. Yes, Peter. One of the, the best part of ESPN I think are your documentaries that you do 30 on 30. Um, and I thought of ones that were nominated for this year. There's so many of them. What's your favorite 30 on 30? My favorite 30 for 30? Um, that's a tough one. Um, it's kind of like asking your favorite kid, you know. But uh, um, I think um, probably the one that was done on the, on the Miami University football team, the U, was, was probably one of my favorites. But there's so many of them. By the way, that whole project came about uh, in 2009 after the economy had uh, not done well and uh, was not doing well. And we had thrown parties every year. Uh, Bill will remember, we threw parties for every anniversary. And we said to ourselves, you know what, let's not have a party. Let's do something more meaningful to celebrate our 30th anniversary. And we decided to do 30,000 hours of community outreach uh, for our employees, set a goal for that, as well as, and that's where the idea came up to do the 30 for 30 documentaries. That's how the name came alive, 30 documentaries for the 30 years. And. Uh, People ask me all the time when I was chairman, uh, well, what do you really do as chairman? <laughs> and I say, well, are you familiar with the 30 for 30 series? And they say, oh, yes, I love it. And I say, well, my predecessor, John Skipper, and I talk frequently, and I asked him recently, John, is 30 for 30 a success? And he says, oh, yes. I said, well, keep it going. <laughs> That's what I did as chairman. Okay, I, I, I had this uh, Ernest young man in the front row. Happens to be my nephew. So, Jack, take it easy. So, kind of going off of college, uh, NCAA, Texas thing, a lot of controversy is going on right now with the athletes not getting paid and that type of thing. And the television companies are making ton of revenue off of it, and so is the NCAA. What are your views on the college athletes' uh, arguments, and do you think they should get paid? I am so disappointed in you. <laughs> Something like, how did you drive to Bristol? Or was the merit congested when you used to drive to Bristol? Would have been a much more appropriate conversation. Uh, I mean, it's an excellent question, all kidding aside. I mean, it's a real issue that there's billions of dollars flowing to the college athletics now. It's not like the old days. So I think those are legitimate questions to be raised. And, and personally, I, I think some you know, adjustments are, are appropriate. I don't know exactly how that's going to lay out, and it's very complicated. You know, you got a lot of sports there. It's not just football. It's not just men's football and men's basketball. They happen to be the revenue sports, but there's a lot of college athletes. So I, I think there's something that should be done. I don't know exactly what that is, but I applaud the college community trying to address it. Okay, I guess we've got time for one last question. Well, that's a great question. I, I mean, I think you're seeing that now. I mean, look at the question is basically: Are we going to enter a period of time where athletes are held to a higher standard, particularly professional athletes, uh, as a you know a kind of bar to be able to continue to play? Is that well, a fair? You see it like in the first one, the Vince Lombardi one, how those they're so it's so strict and so controlled, and then when you watch the Miami one, 
it's a whole different culture of what they play in. So I wonder if that's kind of the start of how the culture turned in that sport. Well, I mean, I don't, I'm not sure if I know the answer to that question, but I do think that, you know, based on what you've seen most recently, uh, particularly uh, with uh, some of the NFL activity last year, I think the bar is being raised, and I think it should be raised. Uh, these are big businesses, and, uh, you know, you need responsible professionals uh, in them, in my opinion. Um, so I guess we're, gonna, we're out of time now. I did want to get one other thing in. It has nothing to do with my book, but I feel strongly about it. We have a great town here in New Canaan. Love living here. Uh, part of what makes this a great town is the local business people, uh, whether it's the Carl family or Jim and Margaret over at the health fair uh, or, uh, you know, the, the Mark and the good folks at Family Bridges or even Wendy at Taylor's Luggage. Uh, <laughs> You know, these people are the heart of our community, and I would encourage you in this, in this day when companies are trying to land uh, drones on your front yard to deliver a book, like mine, uh, it's all, it can be had here locally. And I would just encourage you to support our local merchants to make, continue to make New Canaan the great town it is. So thank you for being here tonight.